So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our data science uh, department seminar. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you, um, Dr. Mengjia Su, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah um, uh, Dr. Xu is currently a postdoc associate um, at the uh, McGovern Institute for uh, Brain Research uh, at MIT, and also, you know, like um, um, uh, as the uh, uh, Division of Applied Mathematics at Brown University at the same time. Um, so, uh, Dr. Meng Jiasu research is very interesting in the, uh, you know, like uh, intersection between computer science, neuron science, and bioimaging. Very interesting topic. And uh, I will not take it uh, any longer. So, uh, um, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. So, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to present my work on graph embedding with uncertainty quantification for diverse applications. Before I focus on my sorry, before I focus on the main uh, topic on graph embedding, I would like to take a few minutes to talk about my other current and past projects. First, I will talk about my current project at MIT, collaborating with Professor Pauju on the normalization and dynamics in deep classifiers with the square laws. As shown here, our loss function, the square loss function, is constrained with two additional terms. One term is about the Lagrangian multiplier term, and the new k is the Lagrangian multiplier, and vk is the normalized weight matrices at different layers. And the last term is about the VDK parameter lambda, and the rho is the product of the Frobenius norm of the weight matrices over different layers. Um, our results mainly show that the gradient descent on the square loss can converge to minimum rho solutions and corresponding to max margin solutions. As shown here in the red plot, this is a training dynamics for the rho over 1,000 training epochs. And this is a margin plot over uh, 1,000 training epochs and 1,000 training uh, initial training iterations. And in addition, our in this project, we also study those solutions and uh, associated with the upper bounds on the generalization error and uh, the neural collapse property. Uh, next project is a recently completed project with the Johnson Deputy Center at Harvard Medical School. Uh, specifically, we address the issue uh, of discovering microaneurysm in the eyes of patients with diabetic retinopathy. Um, compared to traditional founders imaging, our Oslo imaging data is, has very high resolution that enables to uh, capture the macrovascular uh, pathology as shown in this raw data set. And the main contribution in this work is to develop a, a transfer learning based end-to-end -end segmentation model for the Oslo image data set. Um, and this model is composed of uh, two parts. Uh, the encoder part is based on a pre-trained efficient net V3 model. And the decoder part is a regular unit decoder. And our uh, the Oslo net model outperforms the state of the art method. Uh, called NUNet published in Nature Methods. And more detailed of uh, our results can be seen from the archive paper. And the next topic is a project I worked with when I was a visiting PhD student at Brown University. It's an automatic classification system that I designed to use convolution neural networks to characterize the severity of the sickle cell anemia using blood samples collected from MIT uh, nanomechanics lab and uh, MGH at Harvard Medical School. Uh, my main contribution was to design the deep convolution neural networks and test uh, the accuracy for five to eight different classes of red blood cells in sickle cell disease. Um, what you are seeing in this video is how sickle cell change over, uh, over time due to removal of oxygen that is a hypoxic conditions. Now I would like to move on the main topic on graph embedding. Firstly, I will, I will discuss the utility of the graphs. In the real world, there are a lot of um, complex connected data. 
can that can be modeled as the networks of graphs. So for example, here is a human brain networks and uh, financial networks and uh, protein networks. Uh, it's very challenging to learning uh, graph representation uh, uh, compared to learning image representation because uh, graph data has the arbitrary graph size and no spatial locality and no fixed ordering of nodes. It's uh, sometimes dynamic and uh, has multi-model node features. Um, recently, graph embedding has received a lot of uh, attention, which is a very promising uh, technique for learning graph representations. Uh, for example, uh, Nature and Science highlighted on their cover last year about the new mathematics discovered by graph modeling. And uh, uh, another protein folding problem tackled by the DeepMind company uh, also using the graph machine learning methods. Uh, in the next few slides, I will mainly uh, talk about two types of graph embedding methods. Um, the first one is a deterministic uh, point vector based graph embedding method. As shown in the left figure, we can see uh, sparse high dimensional non Euclidean space graphs can be embedded into continuous low dimensional dense vector space. So basically, in the Latin space, each graph node can be represented as a low dimensional vectors. And those vectors uh, as the node embeddings can be easily uh, applied to different um, downstream tasks. For example, we can do uh, 2D visualization for this in, based on these embeddings and uh, with the uh, obvious clusters we can see here. And also you can use it for community detection and link prediction or node classification in different fields. And during graph embedding, the graph structure properties can be maximally preserved. And node similarity in high dimensional space can be easily obtained by computing the vector distance in the low dimensional embedding space. Uh, in the next few slides, I will uh, present, uh, talk about uh, some prevalent uh, examples for embedding graphs into vector space. For example, the first one is an uh, original work proposed in 2014 called Deep Walk Model, which is motivated by a language embedding model called World Walk. And in Deep Walk Model, they can learn the graph embedding uh, into vectors where a word embedding model. Scapegram is one of the uh, world to work model proposed in this paper. And so to learn the uh, vector embeddings using deep walk, they start from uh, sampling some random walks from the original graphs and then training the word, train the word embedding model, scapegram model. And uh, using a loss function here is a negative log stop the maximum function. So uh, to optimize this loss function, we can obtain the optimum node embeddings. Uh, but this method, the limitation is embedding does not preserve local neighborhood of each node well. Uh, and this mod, uh, another method is an improved uh, deep work method called node work proposed in 2016 from Stanford. And they mainly introduce a biased random box strategy with two parameters P and Q to reconstruct the transition probability between node pairs as shown the pi v x. And this enables to capture both the global and global graph structure properties. In summary, there are many advantages in using graph embedding for diverse downstream tasks. Here I have an example for embedding an undirected and binary karate uh, network. And this network is uh, actually a uh, university karate club. Um, and this network can be embedded into point vector embedding space as uh, different points we can see here. Um, and to uh, note the similarity in the high dimensional space, we can easily uh, mirror the obtained by computing the vector distances in the low dimensional space using this few metrics. However, this method is mostly uh, deterministic. So the network uncertainty information is missing. But this is very important for large and complex network systems. And here I will introduce another graph embedding method called stochastic graph embedding, uh, which can embed a high dimensional graph into low dimensional uh, density function space. 
as shown here, each graph node can be encoded as the low dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution in terms of the mean and variance. And the mean uh, can indicate the positions of the nodes in the embedding space as shown in this uh, uh, red point. And uh, the variance uh, determines the uncertainty of the nodes. So, uh, so this is uh, the radius of this ellipse show the standard deviation derived from this variance uh, output. So this uh, is very useful for uh, community detection and link prediction or node classification uh, in different applications. And the first work for stochastic graph embedding was published in 2018. And the model is called uh, graph to gauss G2G model. The main framework in this figure, we can see the main framework contains four steps. The first is sampling node neighbors uh, and generates a node triplet based on a K half neighbor sampling method. And the second, input the graph node attribute matrix as denoted by the capital X here, and input, uh, input this node matrix into a deep encoder uh, model and get the in immediate latent representations. And then uh, using two additional uh, projection layers to output the mean and the covariance matrix. And based on this low dimensional uh, Gaussian embeddings for each graph node, we can compute the similarity of uh, uh, the embedding Gaussians using a KR divergence between different node pairs. And finally, uh, in order to learn the optimal graph embeddings, node embeddings, we need to uh, optimize an energy-based ranking loss function as shown here, which is a, a, a square and exponential loss function. Uh, this is basically, you can minimize the similarity between uh, negative node pairs and uh, maximize the similarity between the positive pairs. And in this slide, I would like to show the importance of embedding uncertainty and how that helps us to detect the intrinsic uh, uh, dimensionality of the network system. As shown in this figure B, we can see that during the training, when, uh, when, uh, when the training starts to exhibit uh, overfitting at this stage, so, uh, the average variance uh, sigma values of some dimensions stay relatively stable, as shown in the red curves, uh, which are 60 dimensions. And the other 58 dimensions uh, keep increase uh, over the training epochs. So um, this stable dimensions actually is a latent dimensional tail of the graph, which is uh, close to the number of the community in the graph. Uh, in this figure B, we can see that if we keep removing the stable dimensions from the embedding uh, 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 from the uh, embedding dimensions, we can see that the, uh, the performance, the uh, link prediction performance, will drop, will show an uh, obvious uh, degradation. Next, I will give two examples from a uh, neural imaging data set uh, related with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So uh, as shown here, uh, there are a lot of uh, dementia patients uh, in, in currently in the United States, and uh, there are 300 million increase for Alzheimer and dementia research funding as an NIH. And uh, in our application project, in my application projects, I mainly focus on two challenging projects. One is the cognitive training effect evaluation using the functional MR brain network uh, uh, data set. And another is the Alzheimer's disease early stage, early stage detection and progression prediction using the MEG functional brain network data. And this uh, work can improve the uh, the functional uh, brain network based biomarkers can help improve the patient management and also can enable disease stratification for clinical studies. So to this end, we develop a flexible uh, deep neural network based graph Gaussian uh, embedding model with uncertainty quantification for functional uh, brain network analysis used for these two projects. Uh, in the first uh, cognitive training uh, uh, effect evaluation project, we have uh, 12 AMCA patients, which is the early stage of Alzheimer's disease patients. And uh, as a baseline, uh, uh, 
uh, the fMRI data set as a baseline. And after the training is about a 20 week training on different multi domain. Um, this figure will show that how to construct the functional uh, brain networks using uh, public uh, power brain atlas. Um, including 264 brain regions, uh, which are the RIs. And the, uh, we use the uh, brain, uh, we use the physical correlation metric to uh, compute the brain connectivity metrics. Here uh, we show the brain network is an undirected uh, and weighted graph. The size is 264 by 264. Um, Identify heterogeneous cognitive impairment markers at an early stage is very uh, critical for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. We develop a quantitatively method for functional brain network analysis of function using the uh, fMRI data set based on uh, developed uh, unsupervised multiple graph Gaussian embedding uh, model. As shown here, this is the main framework of our model. Uh, so specifically, our model takes the computed and directed and weighted fMRI brain networks as the input. Uh, here, uh, the X had is a three-dimensional uh, matrix. So the first dimension P uh, represents the number of the uh, brain networks, and the second N, uh, dimension N is represents the number of the brain regions. And D is the node feature dimension, so which equals to N in our case. Then. We adopted a 3D uh, encoder to learn the hidden representation for this uh, fMRI brain networks. And then we output the mean and covariance, uh, the variance uh, in the latent space uh, using two additional projection layers. And in order to quantify the brain region level uh, uh, changes after the intervention, we use a uh, second processing distance to quantify the brain region level uh, Gaussian distribution distances. Uh, we perform, in order to validate our model, we perform the link prediction to validate and test the performance of our embedded model. And we also find the optimal embedding size uh, L equals to 16. Uh, due to time, I only show one main result as shown here. Uh, the left figure gives the subject level W2 distance, uh, what's its what's in distance uh, um, uh, changes across the 264 brain regions. And uh, the horizontal axis is uh, 12 subjects. And the vertical axis shows the 264 brain regions are eyes. And the uh, color represents the, the what's in distance uh, between uh, the baseline and after the training. So uh, our main finding is that we identify that the D, uh, several sub-networks, for example, the default mode network and the VESO sub-networks and the memorial retrieval sub-network and also attention. And uh, uh, another is uncertain sub-networks to show distinct changes after the cognitive training. Uh, a similar project using MEG uh, neural imaging data we conducted with MIT and uh, Madrid collaborators for, for the AD uh, Alzheimer disease early stage prediction. Due to the lim uh, timing limitation, I cannot present the detail of the methodology here, but you can see from this workflow, we have three different subgroups, norm control and stable MCI and progressive MCI groups. The progressive MCI, is progressive mild cognitive impairment subjects, which will convert to dementia after two years. So uh, we, we use a, a desk and, uh, atlas to construct the MEG brain networks, which include the 68 brain regions in our brain networks. And then we use the developed mg 3 d model to output the probabilistic embeddings in terms of the mean and the variance. Um, and then based on this uh, probability embeddings, we applied it to some uh, classic classifiers in, to do the AD progression early stage prediction and the quantification of the regional effects uh, between different uh, subgroups. And uh, to identify specific uh, brain regions associated with uh, 
associated with the, with the significant AD related effects, we define a new metric here called global, uh, global cluster index, uh, GCI, which is computed based on the W2 distance. <coughs> uh <clears throat> w2 sorry w2 distance between group and uh, within uh some certain group like norm control group and uh, within the civil mci group mm, the main result is that 19 uh regions with significant uh, positive gci values that were uh localized in the frontal and temporary we can see the frontal and temporary temporal and the prior to uh, laws. The last part of my talk, I would like to discuss some exciting developments about the temporary involving graphs. Uh, before I uh, talk about uh, dynamic graph embeddings, uh, I would like to introduce what is dynamic graph. So dynamic graph can be modeled as a, a discrete time graph snapshots at different time intervals or continuous time graph, uh, which can be represented uh, using the temporal edges uh, which, uh, and uh, link predictions, a uh, link stream. Uh, now we develop a dynamic graph embedding method based on the G2G model and the net weather algorithm, algorithms that allows us to deal with graphs changing over time. The main uh, dynamic of uh, G2G model framework for stochastic temporary graph embedding is shown in this figure. Given a dynamic graph uh, represented by the discrete time graph snapshots from J1 to JT, we uh, we, we learned the dynamic graph embedding starting from learning the Latin representation for the first graph stamp shards using a J2G encoder and uh, two projection layers and uh, outputs the mean and covariance metrics using a triplet based on contrastive laws of, uh, in, for training. And to learn the, uh, for the next snap short, um, for the next snap short, Training, we employed an extension of the natural weather net approach to adaptively expand the network hidden layer size based on the number of changing nodes in the next step short in order to effectively capture the temporary graph dynamic during uh, different uh, graph snapshots, we uh, train the encoder in the second time step with the high parameters transferred from the pre-trained model uh, learned from this first snapshot. Um, finally, we train the model with a time-dependent uh, node triplet based loss function, uh, as shown here. And here we, we show two of our eight benchmarks and their involving dynamics. The left of one is a synthetic uh, uh, dynamic uh, benchmark, which includes 1,000 uh, uh, nodes and 50 time steps. And the red side uh, figure shows another benchmark called DIG benchmark, which includes ni around 90,000 nodes and uh, 90 uh, time steps. And DIG benchmark, we can see that is uh, has a highly transient dynamics, and the SBM is relatively smoothly changing over time. Here we show the corresponding link prediction results for those two benchmarks with different embedding size L. And uh, we run this experiment of, uh, with five different random initializations. And we can see from the DIG benchmark results that um, uh, the original space, we have nodes around 60,000. And uh, in the embedding space, we can see that using the embedding size 64, we can get a relatively good performance for the link prediction. And this table show that all of our link prediction results for all eight benchmarks we um, conducted in our experiment and also combined with other four baseline methods, which are mainly uh, based on the autoencoder architecture and uh, uh, graph convolution neural network architecture. As shown here, we can see our uh, that G2G model it outperforms the, the other baseline methods and uh, is quite efficient. And uh, this paper we have is uh, under revision now in the 
TNNF's journal. Uh, in addition, uh, embedding uncertainty is very important for dynamic systems. And these plots are for, uh, these plots are for the eight benchmarks uh, showing uncertainty in terms of the variance uh, as a function of the time. So we can see that uh, after a certain critical dimension, all the results converge for each benchmarks. Uh, this is the optimal dimension of the embedding. And uh, we found the correlation between the optimal embedding size L and uh, the infective dimensionality of the uncertainty D for all eight different benchmarks. This as shown in this uh, table. And this result suggests a clear path that selecting the graph of optimal embedding dimension by choosing L is larger or equals to the UQ uh, uncertainty quantification UQ dimensionality. Uh, last but not least, I would like to talk about the exciting topic of hyperbolic uh, graph embedding. Uh, many real world and complex data set exhibit underlying. I have a quick question here. I'm very interested in, uh, can you go back one slide? Sure. The embedding sure. size. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, do you have any uh, uh, theoretical result regarding, I mean, this is uh, how to choose this optimal uh, embedding size, or this is some um, empirical result to show or guide you how to choose this um, optimal uh, embedding size? Uh, this, this result, uh, we choose the UQ dimensionality based on this actually plot. We can see Right. Uh, right. Empirical. Okay. I'm just curious you now in the field if people have any theoretical to show, okay, this is how we can choose this optimal. Uh, this, um, the, yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, this is a, a good Thank you for the question. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, I, I think there is a, recently there is a paper from, uh, I think from Indiana, there is a group from physics. I think they published a paper. Uh, like a review paper actually uh, last year about uh, the optimal uh, graph embedding dimensionality. And they conducted experiment on about 100 uh, benchmarks. Uh, maybe that paper maybe uh, include some like theoretical or experimental uh, uh, like studies for this, uh, this uh, optimal uh, graph embedding size. Yeah, our results is based on empirical results. But it's proved to be very effective. So in this application or in many applications? Yeah, thank you. Effective to this application. And also, do you think in other, applica other applications, for example, not in image, in NLP, or in other in general applications, do you think it will be the same effective? So, sorry, I, I couldn't hear clearly because the noise in the uh, audio. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, only uh, applicable to this domain, or it's also applicable in uh, like a, like NL in NLP, or in not only limited to imaging, and also in in very because you you see that this graph embedding have a lot of applications. So I'm just curious to know this in this empirical this UQ dimensionality will be also be useful in other applications as well. Yeah, I think this is uh, our result is based on for the graph embedding. Uh, I think for uh, uh, other uh, data set like the image data set, I, 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 I do, I do, I have no idea about that. But the graph embedding uh, is, um, is uh, we we can quantify the uncertainty dimensionality based on this. We um, maybe we. Like maybe we can try on some other data set. I think the natural language embedding mod, uh, data set we can apply this model because the natural language is easily to be modeled as graphs in the original space. Actually, many works actually like the as I mentioned the ontology uh, graphs we can also use this uh, method to mirror the uncertainty dimensionality and the optimal embedding size for each like a uh, uh, concept or word. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, may I ask a question? Very quick question. All right, so you're talking about this dynamic graph. So you have the history of the snapshot on the graph. Have you think about actually using this technology to predict the word future timestamp, what the network looks like? 
Oh, actually, the link prediction experiment is like that to predict if uh, the node is correlated with uh, if if the two nodes are uh, there are can uh, there are links or not. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a single pair. Are you actually sort of predict the future of the entire network who is connecting who? Okay, you, you mean the next step? Uh, the next, next time step, what looks like the network topology? Uh, I think this this uh, model can 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 do that because we can based on the embedding to predict the next future time step the the links in the. So the links in the next time steps. Okay. Are yeah. you using some sort of recurrency across the different embeddings to predict the future embeddings or are you directly using some sort of like a autoencoder? No, we, we didn't use autoencoder in the baseline method here, as we show that it's the, 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 these two methods are based on the autoencoder and the, also the RM method. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, their results is not uh, that good, and also very time-consuming for dynamical graphs. Our results is based, our model is based on a simple encoder model, and then based on a ranking loss function. That's very efficient, highly efficient, and uh, okay. um, yeah, this is uh, we didn't use a recurrent in our model. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarification. Yeah. So, so I think. Yeah, I think we 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 uh, we can hold our questions until the end of the presentations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so in the real world, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, complex and real world that uh, exhibit underlying hierarchy uh, code structure property. For example, the brain networks and the protein networks and the ontology networks and financial networks, or even the COVID-19 spreading networks. Um, to embed such chain-like graph data into limited uh, into the Euclidean space is very challenging because it has limited uh, space and uh, has a highly uh, running time and the memory issue. However, hyperbolic space is, uh, as shown in this figure, is an exponentially gross volume on the boundary. So it can preserve both graph distances and the complex hierarchy, extremely efficient and in very few dimensions. And in this figure, we, we can see that the Euclidean space is a, a very flat space and uh, with zero curvature. However, the hyperbolic space is a, a, a continuous version of discrete trees with, um, with constant negative curvature, which is defined by the negative uh, one over k, and k is larger than zero. When, co when k goes to infinity, then it will convert to the Euclidean space with zero curvature. Uh, hyperbolic space is a simply connected remaining manifold. So there is a very important metric that can be used to measure if a graph is more chain-like or not. So the delta hyperbolicity, if it uh, close to zero, it indicates that a graph is more chain-likeness. And as and currently, there are two mostly commonly used hyperbolic space representation models. One is Poincaré, Poincaré uh, disk model. Another is a, a Lorenz model. As shown in this figure, uh, this is a point create disk model. You can see that uh, the pink, uh, the pink uh, lines show the original graph distances between these two children nodes, X and Y. And the riser curve shows the uh, hyperbolic distance, and uh, which is better approximate the uh, graph distances compared to the Euclidean distances as shown in this blue color in the Latin space. So previously we have mentioned, uh, we have talked about the Gaussian embedding, uh, which can embed each graph node as a probability density function. Uh, that's capturing useful uncertainty, asymmetric and the entombment relations. However, uh, in contrast to the hyperbolic graph embedding, uh, which can learn the continuous node hierarchies from unstructured unstructured complex input observation efficiently and in very few dimensions. Uh, so therefore it can provide a very important uh, graded assertions about different hierarchical 
uh, relations that could benefit many different applications. For example, uh, learning the hierarchy uh, le levels um, in the oncology concepts. Also, the disease uh, symptoms and medications grading for electronic health record set. And in the red set, in the red figure, we show the pointery embedding uh, uh, results from uh, Nico's paper published in 2017. As shown, uh, this in this pointery disk, we can see that in the centroid, this word entity is more generic and uh, has high hierarchy. And when this approaching to the boundary and all these nodes like the, the New York City is more specific and has a low hierarchy. And uh, in this slide, I, I show some of my unpublished and preliminary results for a hyperbolic graph uh, G2G, uh, G2G model for the uh, static graph embedding. Um, that we developed recently, and we performed the link prediction experiment for four static graphs uh, with the four random, uh, five random initializations and different embedding sites. And the four different benchmarks are shown. The number of the nodes and number of edges are shown in this table. Um, and in this figure, we show the link prediction results. We can see that the hyperbolic. Um, performance as shown in the blue curve and uh, the original G2G result is shown in the red curve. The hyperbolic G2G outperformed the original uh, G2G model, especially the achieved the, like this, is achieved the better link prediction performance with a smaller embedding size. And uh, we are currently also working on some dynamic hyperbolic G2G model, which I will not show here, but I intend to use those, mod uh, those results for my first proposal as the preliminary results. So basically in the future, uh, I would, uh, there are, I, I found there are a lot of overlapping integrates with many faculties in the, uh, based on my meeting today. Um, in the department uh, of data science and also computer science, and also other mathematics math, math department, I will all I will reach out to both of those uh, faculties who are um, has common interests or other um, re interesting research topics. In addition to collaboration with uh, um, the data science department and computer science department within the data science institute and across the university, I will also pursue the following possible funded projects. I, here I listed the three possible projects that I plan to work on in the short term. First one is hyperbolic dynamic graph embedding with uncertainty quantification, which is basically to develop a, a hyperbolic graph embedding model that can be applied to a, uh, anomaly event dimension and node clustering or link prediction or community detection in diverse fields in applications. And this work may be funded by the AICR of DOE or size of the NSF or the DS Defense Science Office of the DARPA. And second project may be next generation of deep learning methods based on the biological plausible neural networks. And this work is mainly um, to tackle the high computational costs in the current deep learning models. So we can de develop an efficient neural network based on the biologically plausible models. Uh, for example, using some uh, hearing learning or introducing some other new training algorithms. Uh, this work may be funded by the size of NSF or the DSO of DARPA. Um, and uh, the third uh, project is the trustworthy domain aware machine learning, which mainly uh, aims to improve the interpretability and the actionability and the causality and the fairness or robustness of machine learning methods while simultaneously reducing the data requirements and uh, accelerating model training by integrating domain knowledge. Uh, this work uh, may be uh, funded by the DOE Artificial Intelligence, uh, Intelligence and Technology Office, as well as private sponsors like uh, IBM or Google. And trustworthy AI has also been recently advocated by the DOE and the ASF. And both agencies announced recently a special cause for funding this area as a, as a larger scale. 
um, in the computational neuroscience projects, I uh, have listed the two possible projects here. One is Alzheimer disease progression modeling based on the hyperbolic graph embedding with multi-omics data. Um, so this is to build a generic general stochastic hyperbolic graph embedding framework enabling learning uh, the low dimensional uh, multimodal graph representation in a hyperbolic space by uh, using diverse complementary information from multi modalities, such as neural imaging data, uh, the MEG, fMRI. I, in my previous uh, projects, I also some uh, integrated some uh, genetics or demographics uh, data set. Uh, uh, so in this uh, possible project, uh, I will also obtain the results from some public databases like the Adeni or HCP, but also uh, also from our ongoing uh, collaboration with the research group uh, from uh, Spain, from the Dr. Uh, Mastu, uh, and uh, my MAE, MIT collaborator in the MEG lab. And this work may be funded by the uh, National Institute of on Aging and the uh, National Institute of Biomedical uh, Imaging and uh, Bioengineering. And uh, this is uh, uh, another of uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. So second project is uh, predicting Parkinson's disease dementia, PDD, using deep learning. And this uh, project is basically to employ various demographic demographics data and diverse uh, neurophysiological tests in conjunction with other biomarkers such as brain images, uh, neural imaging of cerebral spatial fluid uh, as input variables and uh, develop a semi-supervised or self-supervised deep learning classification models to assist the clinicians to obtain a quantitative understanding of uh, Parkinson's disease dementia and evaluate new treatments. And this work may also be funded by the NI, NIBIB or NIMH. Uh, beyond all this, I have also outlined other application projects. Uh, I have all outlined uh, most of the details of these projects in my research statement. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the presentations, uh, Mongjia. It's very exciting work. Um, uh, we have uh, about like fifteen minutes for questions. Um, uh, um, yeah, um, do you have any question for uh, for Mongjia, everyone? Yeah, yeah, I do have a have an interesting list. Can you go back to your slides? You mentioned that uh, potential in your future work, the so called a biological plausible. Uh, Network. I don't know if you can elaborate a bit. Can you go back or uh, maybe two or three more slides? Okay. Uh, one second. So, uh, which slide? Uh, no, no. Uh, go, move, uh, go, go, go forward. CS2, right? No, no, no. Sorry. The, the... Three minutes. CS2, right? So that the, the yes. future work, right? Yeah, yeah future CS2. work. CS2. CS2, I think. Yes, yes. So uh, this, you mentioned so-called biologically plausible neural networks. So what does that mean? So can you elaborate a bit about it? Uh, yes. Uh, um, so the biological plausible. Oh, sorry, why is that? Yeah. Could you share your yeah the slide again? Why they automatically stop? I don't know. Yeah. I also very interested in that's uh, that's uh, directions. Okay, so this is based on uh, to tackle the computational cost of uh, the current uh, machine learning uh, deep learning models because, um, uh, as shown here, uh, the biological uh, current uh, the deep learning model is uh, like it's not like what our human uh, human brain did. Our human brain is more energy efficient, and the human neurons learns with uh, spikes and has less needs less memory. And no need of the back propagation. And here, our all of the deep learning current models need fit for the training and then use back propagation and to optimize the whole neural networks and get the predictions. And this is the current uh, the deep learning methods. And, and in the future, I, I think we would uh, pursue some. Uh, 
uh, possible uh, new training algorithms, like uh, to remove the Bible propagation and uh, make the different learning models uh, based on uh, more biological, uh, plausible uh, stuff in the models, I think. That's what uh, I'm thinking. And this can also reduce a lot of computational costs. They, as we can see that the current uh, many and many big uh, deep learning models like the BERT uh, transformer, they cost a lot and it's not uh, economic and uh, uh, economically and also um, spend a lot of energy. Take that's Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the second, sorry, another second question. Uh, we're also working on that hyperbolic space. So in your okay. uh, compared to Euclidean space, is there any downside or a disadvantage of, um, I know the advantage of a uh, hyperbolic space. I'm just curious to know if uh, you are, are you aware of any uh, disadvantage of a hyperbolic, I mean, uh, compared with the um, Euclidean space? Oh, so uh, I think there are the hyperbolic uh, graph embedding as the uh, one, uh, tricky point is on the optimization because they optimize on the uh, manifold, not on the Euclidean space. So uh, so in the hyperbolic uh, graph embedding, you, we need to use uh, remaining uh, SGD. So it's a manifold based uh, optimization method. So when we, uh, we need to first mapping the hyperbolic uh, uh, graph data point into the tangent space and then map back using a log map. So this would be cause some, uh, um, this would be cause some uh, stability problem. But we, uh, I do have uh, read some papers about uh, solving this uh, um, problem, numerical instability problem. Um, I think this is uh, one disadvantage uh, and we need to uh, take be careful about the hyperbolic graph embedding, but uh, the advantage is, uh, yeah, the hierarchical uh, embedding is really uh, helpful, useful for many different fields. That's uh, my answer. Okay, thank you very much. I have the uh, opportunity to others, the uh, audience. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I have. Uh, I think like uh, we have a couple of questions uh, on the um, uh, on the chat. Uh, the first question is from uh, Je Je Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey, right? Um, uh, have these models been applied on uh, chronic conditions of the tinnitus? Uh, is it largely a no neurological conditions with affects approximately fifteen percent of the world's population? Uh, can, uh, can, you re uh, can you please repeat? Uh, I, I would like to see myself. Yeah. Um, uh, the, maybe the yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Jeff, uh, could you uh, uh, ask your question directly? This would be easier. Uh, easier. Sure, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, Thank great. You. Thank you for your presentation, by the way. It's fascinating. Um, tinnitus is a problem that affects most or 15% of the world's population. It's where people hear a, a constant ringing in their ears and the etiology of it probably starts inside the cochlea with a loss of hearing and there's other auditory insults that give rise to the initial condition. But once the condition persists, begins to persist in the brain, it interacts with other networks, other sub-networks in the brain, particularly the limbic system. And I'm wondering, because it's such a chronic condition that affects so many people, I'm wondering if there might be some applicability of your model uh, for you know, machine language and artificial intelligence in that particular health domain. Yeah, that would be a very uh, interesting uh, question and also very useful in my future work, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can share some information with you offline, uh, but I just want to bring it up now because it's a, it's a huge problem in America and also the entire world. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, it would be very good if you can share some uh, information with me. Yeah, some papers or something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey.
Thank you. So, so I have two questions uh, for 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 Meng Yuan. The 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 first question is, uh, you know, like uh, I I still don't understand why you know like uh, multiple graph Gaussian embedding that you introduced, right? You know, like MG two G work well, right? Better than other mechanism function like convolutional or neural nets or something like that on the MEG brain networks. So why 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 is work better? So so. Uh, what is the key reason behind is you know a super superior performance? So um, why the screen suddenly go out? So you mean this product, right? Um. Yeah, you you introduced the uh, yes exactly. So why yeah, why so this one? So this this uh this method uh, because we because uh, this method is we develop this model basically based on our data is very unique is very different from other uh, graph embedding papers because they mainly use um, some public a uh, single large data net uh, data uh, large network for example social network or citation network a single large graph to do embeddings. But our data set is based on uh, undirected and weighted graph. It's a, uh, so the brain connectivity, brain network, the, the weights are very important for the brain connectivity. So in this model, we we take we make use of the weights to compute the uh, graph structure property, like to compute the node neighbors and then uh, embedding them into low dimensional space. And another reason in this model because we do not have any labels. We, this is a cognitive training effects and cognitive training uh, data set. Uh, we only have baseline and the uh, after training. So we do not have any labels. And in this model, we can uh, do an unsupervised uh, graph re a brain network re representation learning. And then we can quantify the regional wise changes. Um, if you, you 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 can also use some uh, traditional graph theory, pro, like uh, build some uh, handcrafted graph features for each graph node. Uh, this is another uh, like maybe twenty years ago. Some uh, also some papers do this on brain networks, but um, but this is where more efficient and more we can have the uncertainty information, the variance to quantify the optimal embedding size in the latent space. That's uh, very useful for, actually this model can be used for all, for all other uh, modality data set, uh, the brain network, like the MEG or the DTI data set. So it's uh, relatively general. I think that's uh, the advantage. Thank you. And I think like there's a uh, related questions uh, to this slide too from uh, Dr. Yu, right? Uh, how, how, how do you build the network? So basically you use, uh, uh, you know, like a way, way uh, distance to, um, to build the networks or how? So, sorry, what to... So basically how, how you build the network, like the brain network, how, how, how did you build it? Okay. So here is how do we build the brain network. So, uh, so the raw data set is a four uh, is a four dimensional fMRI data set. So we have uh, how many uh, like a, a sampling uh, samples from uh, t the baseline time and after the baseline. Uh, we have twelve patients, and uh, we first use the brain atlas to extract uh, to estimate how many uh, regions in this. Uh, uh, in this human brain, and then we average the time series in uh, inside this brain regions, and then like this, this is the regional wise time series, and then compute the uh, phase correlation between these time series across the different regions, and then generates this functional brain connectivity as this, as shown here, and we can uh, easily visualize uh, this uh, graph into three dimensional space. Like yeah. Brain yeah, got it. Th thanks. So th this is you might have negative correlations, right? Positive and negative correlations. You all can use graph convolution to process in them. Yeah, you, you can see this is a phase correlation. This is from minus one to one, the okay. range. Mm. Yeah. Okay. 
Got you. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank why the weights are very important for us. So we, we cannot remove the weights in it, uh, But anyway, uh, there are a lot of papers uh, just to do binary brain network analysis. But uh, yeah. in our work, we because this is a very, you know, the cognitive training, we need to capture some subtle changes, not dramatically changes. So the any information in the raw data set, we need to preserve. We, we, we do not want to remove any useful information from the data set. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Have you try some sort of learning based network building? For example, dynamically create some sort of mapping function doing some sort of k-nearest neighbor. Uh, what do you mean? Can you explain uh, a little bit more, please? Yeah, for example, like last year, they have this paper, something called uh, SLAPS. So give you the input time series as input data vectors, and then you put it into like a neural network, and then translate into certain hidden, uh, embedding vectors. Then you can oh. do pairwise calculation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you mentioned the paper from a company, right? Startup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. The uh, dynamic yeah. network construction. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, although I saw the news, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's another way. So you can directly pre -process, uh, process this uh, brain network data based on the original time series data. But um, there is uh, also some, because you need to pre-process all the training data, so the time series. And also another problem, um, we cannot uh, capture uh, the regional wise. Um, so it, in this way, in our uh, work, we can uh, like, a lo lo like a locate different uh, brain regions uh, like clearly in a clear way. But um, yeah, you can also do another way based on the original time series and then input the time series and the predictions. Um, yeah, but, but in, in our project, uh, because doctors are uh, uh, more caring about which regions, uh, which parts of the brain are more like related with the, the cognitive training or relevant to improve or not. So, um, I, so we decided to use some brain atlas, but it uh, but it's also uh, possible to just input the time series to do prediction in another way for this part. Yeah. So we have we have one minute left. I would like to ask a very general question. You know, like uh, you you listed five projects. How 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 do you feel that you are uniquely fit to carry out those project? So. What makes you like uh, standing out from the rest to really carry out the project? And, and what is the challenging issue you're going to address there? Uh, uh, so can, uh, so you, you mean, uh, can you repeat the question again, please? Sorry. The question is, uh, how, how do you feel like you are uniquely fit, right, to carry mm -hmm. out this, this project? And okay. what is the challenging problem you are trying to solve here? Okay, okay. Thank you for these good questions. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so uh, first, uh, for the first uh, computer science project, the hyperbolic one, uh, we already have like half done uh, preliminary and unpublished results on this uh, um, project. And uh, I, 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 I currently I'm looking for uh, like uh, to finish the paper in by by this summer. So uh, this project that we, we could done, and, but we can also uh, apply some proposal. This is the first uh, um, proposal maybe I would like to apply. Um, and next uh, project is a biological plausible neural network. Uh, we have, uh, because I, I have been a postdoc at MIT, my government brain institute for like, uh, how many years? <laughs> Two and a half years uh, about. So, and many different groups have this, uh, uh, like uh, expert, uh, we have a lot of experts in this field. And also um, my uh, Brown University group also has a lot of experiences. Um, so we, we, we can, I, I will accumulate uh, some uh, like a fundamental uh, 
um, research experiences for this product and also some uh, skills in this product. So, and this is also my future interest. And this product would be uh, funded by the NSF adapter. Um, challenges. I, I, uh, and this project, uh, we already have a collaborator and the data set is already there. So I think uh, it would be uh, easy to uh, write some uh, proposals on this. Um, uh, so what, what do you mean the challenging uh, part? Uh, I, yeah, basically yeah, we can discuss offline. I think we run out of time. Basically, not the challenge, I mean like, like a very critical problem that uh, not easy fix or not easy done uh, overnight, you know, like, um, yeah, fundamental problem, right? To really push the boundary of uh, of the discovery of the field, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I in think order to, yeah, we have discussed that in our meeting. I think we are both interested in this project, right? And um, this is a very challenging project in the... Yeah, on the other, like, uh, yeah, we can discuss uh, offline, yeah. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, everyone. I think, like, we're running out of time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.